Not only because I think uh, Rabbi Jonathan Infeld uh, is a rabbi's rabbi, but Rabbi Jonathan Infeld is from Pittsburgh. So, as Rabbi Bregman mentioned, when, when I'm asked, where, where's hope? I think as for many people in the university world, students and even professors, home is in more than one place. I lived here, I've been rabbi of Congregation Beth Israel for 13 years now, and will be here for many more years. And certainly, Vancouver is home. But I was born in and raised in Pittsburgh. And only moved from Pittsburgh when I started university at the age of 18. And so for me, Pittsburgh has also always been home. Pittsburgh is the place that I go visit when I'm visiting family. It's my other home. And so this horrific tragedy, this massacre at Tree of Life, which by the way is a synagogue that I have been to many times, it's very close to home. As well, the other two synagogues that met in Tree of Life, I've been involved in both of those synagogues, attending one of them while I was in university, every time I would come back from university. And the other was the synagogue in which my wife's best friend, father, was the rabbi for many years. One of the things that has helped bring comfort over the last number of days are the many letters of support that I have received. Letters from my own congregants, letters from the Jewish community in general, letters from politicians, and letters from religious leaders from across the country. Received a letter from the bishops of the Catholic Church of Canada. And late last night, I received one of the most powerful letters of all. I received a letter from the president of a local mosque sharing extremely powerful, meaningful, and clearly words that were meant from the heart as we say in Hebrew with Kavanah, words meant to comfort and words of solidarity. And I, I responded to this letter, even though it was late at night, immediately. And I explained, just as these two wonderful students here from UBC, these leaders explained, that the reason Tree of Life was targeted was because they've recently been supportive of Hyas. Now for me, Hyas is more than just an organization. For me, Hyas also is the organization that in 1938 helped bring my mother from Germany to Pittsburgh. Hyas is also the organization that in 1947 helped bring my father from a DP camp in Frankfurt, Germany, after having survived the Holocaust, the rest of his family being killed, coming from Krakow, Poland, originally. And I've read that Hyas has said that originally we were an organization that was established to save Jews, because we are Jewish. And now we are an organization who saves others because we are Jewish. And so in my response to this beautiful letter written from the president of the mosque, I explained this family history. 
and I explain the importance of the fact that Hayes in recent years has been involved in bringing Muslims to freedom in the United States. It's a very important connection. It makes sense that our two communities would pull together. It makes sense that other communities would come together in this moment of tragedy, in this moment of feeling vulnerable, in this moment of pain. But I want to share a little piece of me with you today, and why it is that I'm a rabbi, and how I believe we can take one step forward. Many of us here are in university. We're in that point in our lives in which we are in the process of growth, becoming our own individuals. We always take with us a little piece of, of our parents. But what do we also do? We also take a little piece of our reaction to our parents with us. And so I am a rabbi because of my parents. I am a rabbi because they gave me a strong sense of Jewish identity. I am a rabbi because they gave me... Most obvious is the worst. Eleven Jews were murdered. Murdered because they were Jewish and murdered in a place of Jewish worship. Jews across the world are in mourning for the Jews of Pittsburgh, and though shocked and horrified, we are not entirely surprised. This is far from the first time that Jews have been murdered in a synagogue, no less. This tragedy occurs in the context of rising This afternoon, not only because I think uh, Rabbi Jonathan Infeld uh, is a rabbi's rabbi, but Rabbi Jonathan Infeld is from Pittsburgh. Thank you, Rabbi. So, as Rabbi Bregman mentioned, when, when I'm asked. 
There's hope. I think as for many people in the university world, students and even professors, home is in more than one place. I lived here, I've been rabbi of Congregation Beth Israel for 13 years now, and will be here for many more years. And certainly, Vancouver is home. But I was born in and raised in Pittsburgh. And only moved from Pittsburgh when I started university at the age of 18. And so for me, Pittsburgh has also always been home. Pittsburgh is the place that I go visit when I'm visiting family. It's my other home. And so this horrific tragedy, this massacre at Tree of Life, which by the way is a synagogue that I have been to many times, it's very close to home. As well, the other two synagogues that met in Tree of Life, I've been involved in both of those synagogues, attending one of them while I was in university, every time I would come back from university. And the other was the synagogue in which my wife's best friend, father, was the rabbi for many years. One of the things that has helped bring comfort over the last number of days are the many letters of support that I have received. Letters from my own congregants, letters from the Jewish community in general, letters from politicians, and letters from religious leaders from across the country. Received a letter from the bishops of the Catholic Church of Canada. And late last night, I received one of the most powerful letters of all. I received a letter from the president of a local mosque sharing extremely powerful, meaningful, and clearly words that were meant from the heart, as we say in Hebrew with kavanah, words meant to comfort and words of solidarity. And I, I responded to this letter, even though it was late at night, immediately. And I explained, just as these two wonderful students here from UBC, these leaders, explained, that the reason Tree of Life was targeted was because they've recently been supportive of Hyas. Now, for me, Hyas is more than just an organization. For me, Hyas also is the organization that in 1938, helped bring my mother from Germany to Pittsburgh. Hyas is also the organization that in 1947 helped bring my father from a DP camp in Frankfurt, Germany, after having survived the Holocaust, the rest of his family being killed, coming from Krakow, Poland, originally. And I've read that Hyas has said that originally we were an organization that was established to save Jews, because we are Jewish. And now we are an organization who saves others because we are Jewish. And so in my response to this beautiful letter written from the president of the mosque, I explained this family history. And I explain the importance of the fact that Hyas in recent years has been involved in bringing Muslims to freedom in the United States. It's a very important connection. It makes sense that our two communities would come together. It makes sense that other communities would come together in this moment of tragedy in this moment of feeling vulnerable, in this moment of pain. But I want to share a 
a little piece of me with you today. And why it is that I'm a rabbi. And how I believe we can take one step forward. Many of us here are in university. We're in that point in our lives in which we are in the process of growth. Becoming our own individuals. We always take with us a little piece of, of our parents. But what do we also do? We also take a little piece of our reaction to our parents with us. And so I am a rabbi because of my parents. I am a rabbi because they gave me a strong sense of Jewish identity. I am a rabbi because they gave that part of my parents' Jewish identity would be the hatred of hatred would be the hatred of anti-Semitism, would be the hatred of racism. I certainly take that with me. But one of the things that I wanted to do in my career, in my life, was not only hate those who hate, but really, more important than that, is bring love into this world. Bring love to those who love. It may be even bring love to those who hate. And by doing that, I believe that we are able to not only improve this world, but make it a significantly better place for all of us to live. It's the love of love that I have dedicated my career to, that I've dedicated my life to. It's easy for us to join together in reaction to an act of hatred, in reaction to a massacre, in reaction to a horrific act like we saw this past Shabbat, this past Sabbath, this past day of holiness. But I want to encourage all of us to really use this moment as a catalyst in order to bring more love into this world. So that we join together, not only, not only holding candles and mourning in the future, but we join together as a community, not only here at UBC, but beyond in love. The letter that I received last night was written to me by the president of this mosque but also specifically and the words that were used to the mosque's Jewish brothers and sisters. Let those be the words that we remember from this point forward. Thank you again, Rabbi Greg. That is not possible. And a crime is one of those instances, and so all of the victims would have to have been cleared by law authority. Today, the funerals began and will continue throughout the week. We are here to light candles, to remember them. And your candles are to remind us that there is light, that above the clouds there is this sunshine. That sometimes when we cannot see it, we have to search a little deeper. And so we're now going to call on Adam and Ari to light these candles, and in doing so, to mention the names, the 11 names, of these precious human beings that are no longer physically amongst us. Joyce Feinberg, age 75. Born in Canada, Joyce moved her family to Pittsburgh and taught at the University of Pittsburgh, researching how children and teachers learn. She loved greeting people at the door to treat like a city. Richard Gottfried, age 65. 
Richard had just celebrated his 38th wedding anniversary and regularly volunteered at the Free Dental Clinic, as well as provided marriage counseling to young couples. Jerry Rabinowitz, age 66. Jerry was a beloved doctor and is remembered for his compassionate care for HIV patients. Back when people shunned and stigmatized those patients, Dr. Jerry Rabinowitz held their hands without a voice. He died in the shooting trying to aid the world. Cecil Rosenthal and David Rosenthal, age 59 and 54. Cecil and his brother David were fixtures at the synagogue, attending services nearly every Saturday for much of their lives. Cecil's job during services was to carry the flag. Daniel Stein. Daniel was thrilled to be a new grandfather. He was very much involved with the synagogue, having served as its cast president and previously on the board of directors. Melvin Wax, age 88. A friend described Melvin as a person who always had a smile on his face. Neighbors remembered Wax as a quiet, sweet man who would tip his head in a gentlemanly gesture to say goodbye. He was the first to arrive at services and often loved them. Bernice and Sylvan Simon. Neighbors of Bernice and Sylvan Simon remember them as sweet, kind, and loving. They often saw Sylvan opening the door for his wife. They were married at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 1956. Irving Younger, age 69. Irving always helped with whatever was needed at the synagogue. He had two grandchildren in California. He adored and constantly shipped showed pictures of the kids and what they were doing to everyone who was around. Rose Malinger, aged 97. Rose was a Holocaust survivor. She came to the United States after the war. She and her sister were usually the ones preparing breakfast for the congregants on Shabbat. She's remembered for her sin living a full life and is survived by her many children, grandchildren, and a great grandchild. And now I'd like to call on the other rabbi of UBC, my colleague Rabbi Sholem Loeb of uh, UBC Chabad. We will be reciting, perhaps, of the 150 psalms, the one that is known by most individuals, if they know any psalm at all. It would be the one written by the young shepherd boy, David, Psalm 23. Psalm by David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. He lays me down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul, he directs me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your God and your staff, they will comfort me. You will prepare a table for me before my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my 
cup is full. Only goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many years. My name is Gabby. I'm a fifth year student here at UBC. I, like many of the people behind me, have had a really difficult time processing the horrific events that we are here to, to, to commemorate. I've been overcome with sadness, with grief, and with heartbreak. But I was not surprised or shocked, like many of us have already said. In my lifetime, I have known countless mass shootings, so many, in fact, that I'm really afraid of becoming numb to them. Until this weekend, when the shooting happened to my people, my reaction to this event was disproportional to the reactions I have had to the shootings in the past. And while this particular shooting strikes a deeper chord with me because it happened to my people doing something that I do on Shabbat, going to shul, my reaction should be the same for any tragedy that targets any marginalized group. Our LGBT and black communities, both intersectionally and otherwise, our Muslim and Christian and indigenous siblings have stood up for us and with us during this time. And I'm so grateful to know this collective solidarity amongst our groups. In Judaism, we have a teaching called Tikkun Olam, which means to heal the world. This weekend, 11 worlds were destroyed, and marginalized communities and allies are practicing Tikkun Olam the world over, and it's so inspiring. So we all need to continue to stand together against violence and hatred that targets any marginalized community to heal the world, because we are stronger together. In Psalm 133, there is a line that is known to many Jews and perhaps some non-Jews as well, but the line is known perhaps because of a melody that has been attached to it. It is on your sheet. It is the first selection. Behold how good, how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters can dwell together. This today is a prayer. It's up to us for it to become a reality. Michaela and Ohad, if you please come forward. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Gabriel. One of the first individuals that I met upon becoming the executive director of Hill LBC back in 2013 was an individual by the name of Craig O'Brien. Craig was the chairman and continues to be because we refused to let it be anything but of the UBC chaplaincy, a collection of men and women, 17 of us, who gather twice a month in this building. And many of our colleagues are here, scattered throughout the crowd, and thank you. I've asked Greg for a few words on this occasion.
serving with the multi-faith chaplaincy gives us the opportunity uh, to call each other's names, on occasion to call each other names. Right? Right. What happens? But what is in a name? Why do names truly matter? Consider for a moment your own name. Someone gave it to you. Naming is a special moment. Naming does many things all at the same time. It remembers and it differentiates. It connects and it blesses. It says this one is here now in the present and also may chart a future for that one who's been given. Saturday, I was in Austin, Texas, and as the news came across, I felt horrible. As this violent act of hate was broadcast, I felt grieved. And as I realized and reflected on the moment of the Shabbat, but also the naming that was happening at that very moment, and how it was interrupted, there's many names in the scripture and in the names of Cain and Abel we have a story of two brothers but we also have the story of humanity denied we have the story of one who is powerful and we have the story of one who seemed weaker but it's truly a story of denial Denial of common humanity and common connection. As Cain, when asked, where is Abel? said, who is Abel? It's a denial of the Creator's action, choice, very word that we deny our human connection. Theologian and scholar Walter Brueggemann says in our anxious society that we live in a society that wants to sort out, divide, and alienate. Creating hostility is a big industry among us. We must be careful and take stock when names are used to divide and alienate and sort out and create hostility. There are always powers rising up that would do so, that would take advantage and feed on social and economic grievances. Madeleine Albright has observed this, and she says that this includes a little belief that's taken advantage of. It's that belief that the People over there are receiving better treatment than they deserve, while I'm not getting what I'm owed. She's right. This strange mixture of victimization and entitlement is being taken advantage of. So what are we to do today as we consider the names and the lives of these dear and precious people? As a follower of Jesus, I hold to a familial connection to the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I pay attention when it says of the Creator, He called them by name. And so I 
gathered today. With you and with Jewish friends and brothers and sisters. Not to divide, but to come near. And I would encourage you, as students and friends and community, to learn names. Not in order to divide. sacred text, the Torah. And what would have been read in that synagogue, as it would have been, was read throughout the Jewish world, was the parasha known as Vayeha. And in this parasha, Sarah is told that she's going to have a child in her old age. But before that happens, Abraham does have a first child. His name is Ishmael. And then a second child would be born with the name of Laughter, Yitzchak. It was the beginning of putting together two peoples who would share a father. And whether the story was of Ishmael and Ibram or Abraham and Isaac, those stories have come down in two very powerful narratives and traditions, one in the Quran and one in the Torah. I mention that because come this January, it will be two years since we heard the horrific news of the slaughter of those six Muslims in Quebec City who died for the same reason that the 11 Jews died on Shabbat. In Quebec City, they died because they were Muslims. In, Quebec, in Pittsburgh, they died because they were Jews. And many of us gathered outside of the mosque on West 8th to show our solidarity. I received phone calls from the heads of that mosque the other day, from Harun Khan and Tarek again expressing unbelievable sorrow, dismay, and also solidarity. It was during that period of time that I met a UBC student, one of the tallest individuals I've ever met in my life. And that began a relationship that continues to today. And so to bring a message from the Jamia Mosque and from Muslims who care and love about peace in the world, it is my privilege to call on Abu Bakr Khan for words. And please know that Muslims throughout the United States have been donating furiously to the relief of the families in Pittsburgh. Same night, the BCMA, the BC Muslim Association, they did their 50th anniversary dinner. So I'm in a room with 500 Muslim people. We're all having a meal. We're just having a good time. And I remember I started hearing whispers. I remember that I got a text message. I didn't pay any attention to it. I was just so caught up in the moment, hanging out with my friends. And then my uncle breaks the news to me. And he said, you know what? There's been a shooting at a mosque. I remember that, that day, I remember that night, like you can't forget it, you, can, you never forget where you were during these moments, these horrific moments. 
whether that's what happened at the Sikh Gurdwara in Wisconsin, you never, you never forget where you were during those moments. And I remember I just, I was so caught, I was just so, there was so much emotion, so much anger. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Now that same night, there were some young guys and they wanted to do a vigil. So I reached out to them on Facebook and we ended up going to the bank for a mosque. And we did this vigil. They came into the mosque for the first time in their life. They got to walk in. They saw a room with a carpet and four walls. They were baffled. It was just, it's just there's four walls and a carpet. And I remember Rabbi Bregman was a big part of it, but that next weekend we did a rally. And we did a rally called Love Over Fear at Jack Pool Plaza. Now why I'm bringing this up is because that's something that stuck with me till that day, is love over fear. Right now, it's as, as the rabbi was saying too, look, there's a lot of people that have, they're trying to push fear, that's their rhetoric. But the fact that this Jewish community was helping Muslim refugees, that's love. The fact that, again, we're working together, that's love. And they don't like that. They don't like it when we're coming together. They don't like the fact that, again, Jewish people and Christian people, there's a fireside chat at the mosque between a rabbi and an imam. They don't like that. You know, it's hilarious, by the way. But they don't like that. And so for me, look, I have to be better. That's what I realized. I have to be better. I have to be even more open, especially when horrendous crimes like this happen. I have to be better. I have to be more welcoming. I have to be more open. Because again, love is the answer. And that may sound cliche, but it's the key is we have to be open. So one thing that I'm going to do is, again, the last two times I've been to the Jewish Community Center, the first time there was a bomb threat. I, I swear to God, it was a coincidence. And the second time was this Sunday. I got to start going to different places of faith. When there's not a horrendous act that's making me go there, I just want to go and hang out with you. I think that's the key is we have to start just welcoming one another and opening up because that's the way forward. So I'm going to New York for the first time this week. And my goal is to actually go and have a dinner during the Sabbath, to actually go and meet and spend time and learn because I find that once we go and we humanize one another, once we go and we meet each other, we realize that again, we have so much more in common. Minus me and Rabbi Bregman's height deficit. I mean, we have a lot in common. So I would just end off with this. And this is another moment we're all going to remember. We're never going to forget. But are we going to move forward with fear? Or are we going to move forward with love? Thank you. Center more Jewish, and the answer came back, lower the basketball hoops. <laughs> Within our tradition, there is a memorial prayer called El Malay Rachamim. We pray that God now protects the souls of the departed. I will be chanting this in the Hebrew, and then we will have, I believe, Ellie Sherman, who will be reading a interpretive translation of this ancient prayer. Please rise. <laughs> Torim Kizohar Harakiyan Mahaziri Ehet Koran Shemo Shelacharasar Yehudi Shedir Ratsu Al Kidush Hashem Be Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, at Sota Brit Lahen Al Harachamim Yastirem b'seter kenafav le'yol ani V'yisrar b'yisrar chachayim et nishmotehem Adonai hu nakaratam b'gan eden Tehem nukhatam V'yamdu l'balam l'kets Yamanim v'nomar v'nomar Amen. Author of life, people have.
turn violent, cutting down innocence, crushing lives, upending dreams, attacking hope with hatred. Source and creator, grant a perfect rest under your tabernacle of peace to the victims of murder at the Tree of Life Synagogue, whose lives were cut off by violence, an act of witless aggression, and calculated anti-Semitism. Remember the survivors of this horror, and the victims of any violence, suffering, or despair. Grant them shelter and solace, comfort and consolation, blessing and renewal. Grant them endurance to survive, strength to rebuild, faith to mourn, courage to heal, and devotion to each other. Heavenly guide, hand of love and shelter, put an end to anger and hatred, bigotry and fear, and lead us to a time when no other, when no one suffers at the hand of another. For the sake of our people, and for the sake of your holy name, grant the Jews of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, your protection, your wholeness and healing, and your peace. And so we are about to conclude, and I guess uh, nature is telling us, yes, it's time. With the ancient words of prayer, most of it is not in Hebrew, it's in the ancient language of Aramaic, a language that was spoken some 2,000 years ago. The prayer is known as the Kaddish. For Jews, in many instances, it's related to as a memorial prayer to death, and yet the word death does not appear. We praise God. As a side note, this prayer was known to a young Jew of Judea some 2,000 years ago. And this young Jew decided to take this prayer and write his own version of it. And that prayer has come down in history to be known as Our Father Who Art in Heaven. Now to lead us in Kaddish, we call on our student to please if you have in front of you the uh, Kaddish. Say shalom bimrama. May the one who makes peace in the high heavens, he may he make peace for us, for Israel, and for all humankind. And together we say Amen. Amen. Yeah, I say shalom. Yeah, I say 
Go to your homes in peace. Amen. 